Hey, friends. Good morning. Welcome to Richville United Church of Christ. Uh, we find ourselves in the third week of the Pentecost season. Um, today is our monthly OCWM special mission offering. OCWM, for those of you who don't know, stands for Our Church's Wider Mission. So once a month, we take up a little bit extra in our offerings to support the work of the whole national church. Okay, it's to support the administrative duties, the ministerial jobs, the missions of our denomination. Um, if you are so inclined, if God gives you, you the ability, uh, just note on your offering envelope that it's for OCWM. Um, as Karen noted last week, we're kind of trying to scale back on announcements, but I do want to remind everybody, you get a messenger every week. You get a monthly newsletter. We have a Facebook page. We have a website. We have an Instagram. We, okay? Um, but go ahead and scour this for yourselves. Um, we do have a, a special meeting coming up um, uh, on a Wednesday evening, uh, so please make note of, of that announcement. Uh, but beyond that, are there any other pressing uh, ideas that need to be shared uh, at this moment? Okay, seeing none, we welcome our friends who are joining us online as well. Uh, as, I, as I already stated, if you go to richvilleucc.com, uh, you can download today's worship folder, our weekly messenger with our announcements and our prayer concerns, uh, and also a children's activity bulletin. All of that being said, uh, let us uh, move into God's power and presence, uh, experience the, the, the spirit of Pentecost, uh, and let us be recreated every day in Christ's image as we enjoy the gift of music from Jeff, Sing a New Church. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jeff. Beloved sisters, brothers, members, guests, and friends, welcome once more to Richville United Church of Christ. Let us be a people who lean into the center of our faith. We all come from different places, backgrounds, experiences, ideologies, political affiliations, education, income. But here, Christ is central. And he is our strength. So let's sing and celebrate that with our opening hymn, number 508, verses 1 and 3.
Amen. If you'll please remain standing as you're comfortably able and draw your attention to our call to worship and prayer of confession. The call to worship this morning is uh, based on Romans 4, chapters 13 through 25. Our forefather Abraham received your promises, not through the law, but because of his faith. Neither he nor we have been made righteous by our own actions, but by your grace. So forgive us once more, we pray, when we think we can do it on our own. Remind us that the gift of your mercy came through the faith we share with Abraham, the father of us all, who was to become the father of many nations. Help us to stand in your presence, just as he did, believing in you, and trusting that you are the one who gives life to the dead and calls into existence the things that have not existed. Grant us, we humbly ask, hope against hope. Teach us that we are to have spiritual descendants as numerous as the stars. Then regardless of our age, our strength, our weaknesses, we will not waver. Instead, we will give you the glory and to be fully convinced that you are God and you will do what you have promised. Allow our faith in you to be credited to us as righteousness. And assure us again that our belief will lead others to also believe in Jesus, our Lord, whom you raised from the dead. He gave up his life so that our sins and mistakes might be washed away, and you raised him so that we might be justified. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. It's at this time that we turn to the center of our worship, which, of course, is the reading and the hearing of God's holy word. The reading this morning comes from John 5, 7 through 15. I had to read this several times myself just to kind of get the grasp of it, but it's, it's really a simple thing once you, once you read through it. So hopefully I can read it clear enough that everybody can get a clear picture here. For there are three that testify, the spirit, the water, and the blood, and the three are in agreement. We accept human testimony, but God's testimony is greater because, because it is the testimony of God, which he has given about his son. Whoever believes in the son of God accepts this testimony. Whoever does not believe God has made him out to be a liar because they have not believed the testimony God has given about his son. And this is the testimony God has given us eternal life. And this life is in his Son. Whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have the Son of God does not have life. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life. This is the confidence we have in approaching God that if we, we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, Whatever we ask, we know that we have what we ask of him. Thank you, Scott. That's God's word to and for the people of the Lord, according, according to John's first letter to the early church. Uh, we pray, as always, that the Lord would bless our reading, our hearing, our understanding, and most importantly, our application of this and all of the Holy Scriptures. Before we move into our message time in earnest, we do want to take a few moments and share God's love and truth with our youngest friends. So, this is the day the Lord has made. 
We will rejoice and be glad in it. I am a child of the Most High God. Wonderfully and fearfully made. Amen. Hallelujah. This is a, a gift from God this day. And each one of you is a child of God made in God's image. And we are especially thankful for the actual children in our faith community, whether in person or online. Okay, so today we start our summer sermon series based on your suggestions, scriptures, and topics. And the question that I was asked that we're going to be addressing today is, how can I be sure of my salvation? How can I be sure of my salvation? That's where we're going today. Children's message, regular sermon, everything else. All right. How many kids have a favorite snuggly or... Security blankets. Some of you grown folks still have it in your pack away boxes, don't you? Grandmama knitted it together for you. My oldest still has hers from when she was an infant. It started out this big. It is now a strip of something that kind of looks like linen. You could floss with it, but she still has it. Is anybody scared of monsters under your bed? No? Well, good. I, I taught my kids whenever they would have a nightmare or get scared in the middle of the night to say, Jesus is king. Roar! And that'll drive out the fears and the demons, okay? But many of us, when we were younger, when we were growing up, we were afraid of the dark, scared of monsters under our beds. But we had this magic gift, didn't we? They can't get me now. Anybody else? If my foot's sticking out from beneath the sheet, it can get me. But if I stay under my security blanket, I'm going to be safe. Now, that's silly and kind of childish. But the reason why I share that illustration is whatever you're scared about, doesn't God in Jesus wrap us up in the safety and security of his love, of the promise of salvation? What Mr. Scott just read for us tells us to be at peace. It wraps us in a warm whoopee a fuzzy blanket. For all of the chaos and nonsense swirling around in our lives and our world, we have the word of God, the testimony of the Holy Spirit, the act of baptism, the blood of Jesus the Christ, to say, there, there, baby, it's going to be okay. So let's go ahead and pray for our kiddos. We don't have uh, Sunday school for them uh, during the summer unless someone signs up in particular. Christian Ed takes a break. Uh, but uh, we praise God for them being in our presence, joining us online, what have you. Let's go ahead and talk to the Lord, okay? Holy and gracious God, what a beautiful day in your creation that you have given us. It's like that warm embrace we just mentioned. It reminds us of your care and your concern for us. And being together in the church family is an extension of that reminder. We look around the pews and we see friends and family, sisters and brothers and neighbors who know your love and are trying to share it with each other. We pray that each one of our children experiences that love, that they have the security blanket of Jesus the Christ. Whether they're going to school, they're on summer break, they're at athletics, they're hanging out with their family. Finally, Holy One, we praise you 
for all of your children. And this we lift up before you in the name, the power and authority of your son, your precious holy child, our brother, savior and Lord, Jesus the Christ. And may all God's kids say, amen. All right. Um, in just a second, I'm going to ask you guys to help me invoke the Holy Spirit, that spirit of Pentecost, so that we're all hearing the same message. But before I get there, uh, I do want to acknowledge that especially with the summer sermon series <clears throat> and today's topic in particular, each one of your suggestions could be a 12-week Bible study in and of itself, all right? So I'm going to do my best to give you an overview of the topic, but am I going to do it justice? Probably not, okay? Nevertheless, let's start our journey together once more in prayer. God of fire, God of water, God of wind, God of the blood and the bread, we thank and praise you once more for this opportunity to be together in your spirit, your presence, and in fellowship with each other. We come here because we believe in your saving power, and we would ask throughout our fellowship and our worship today, you would strengthen that belief so that we might go out and strengthen others. Now, as we dive into the word and the topic at hand, I would ask that the words of my mouth and the thoughts and meditations of each of our hearts and minds might be acceptable in your sight. For we do pray it through our rock and redeemer, the living, the resurrected and resurrecting word, Jesus our savior. And may all God's people say, amen. amen. Cogito ergo sum. Cogito ergo sum. That's the Latin phrase from Rene Descartes, the famous French philosopher and mathematician. I think, therefore I am. I think, therefore I am. How do we know that we're not just somebody else's dream? That was the question he was addressing philosophically. The very fact that I can come up with my own independent thoughts, nonsensical as they might be sometimes, but the fact that I can come up with my own thoughts means I do truly exist. I begin the message time sharing that because Similarly, if you're even asking the question, how can I be sure that I'm saved? You're at least on the right path. I think therefore I am. Am I truly saved? You're on the right path. You may not have arrived yet, but how can you be sure of your salvation? You're asking the question in the first place. However, as we ask the question, how can I be sure of my salvation? We need to get into a bit of defining of terms. What are we asking versus what is God saying and has been doing historically throughout the scriptures and the faith traditions of the human family? I'm going to give you a, a 10 cent word here from theology and philosophy. The word is soteriology. Soteriology. And what is soteriology? Soteriology is the study of the nature or the doctrine of salvation. So really, what I've been asked to address today is a soteriological discussion. What is the nature of salvation and how can I be assured of my Christian salvation? Now in Thayer's lexicon of biblical Greek, we get a number of definitions of what soteriology or 
salvation is biblically. You and I have our own ideas of what salvation is. But what does the word of God, what does the history of the church say about what salvation is? Let me give you Thayer's uh, definition. Deliverance, preservation, safety. Deliverance from the molestation of enemies. In an ethical sense, it is that which concludes the soul to safety or salvation. Messianic salvation. Salvation as the present possession of all true Christians. Future salvation, this is for the folks who are studying Revelation with me on Wednesday nights, it's the sum of the benefits and blessings which the Christians redeemed from all earthly ills will enjoy after the visible return of Christ from heaven in the consummate and eternal kingdom of God. Did you get that? Those definitions that I just gave you are very inclusive, and this is what it means in a nutshell. Salvation is about setting people free. And it's also about giving them peace for eternity. It's a both and proposition. So often in contemporary Western Christianity, when we talk about salvation, it is too narrow of a definition. I don't want to go to hell. I'd really like to go to heaven. Please tell me that I'm saved. Is that how small God's definition of salvation is? It's much larger than that. Liberated, set free, forgiven, put at ease. In classical evangelicalism, there's, there's a phrase which, which I like, once saved, always saved. If you confess Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, even if you backslide, even if you screw up, your salvation has been secured because you're such a great person, right? No. Because the price has been paid through the grace and the love of Jesus the Christ and his sacrifice. Once saved, always saved. But I, I want to go a bit further. I think it should actually say, once saved, continually being saved. My soul was saved the day I got down on my knees and confessed what a screw up I am and my need for a Messiah. My soul was saved the rest of my life. <laughs> I need salvation every day in every way, don't I? And does not the rest of society. There are still people enslaved in this world. Cruelties and injustices, confusion and misunderstanding, malice and just plain stupidity. We all need saved from ourselves and each other. Not just for the day we die, but right this minute, don't we? The biblical definition throughout the scriptures, I want to suggest, of salvation is a holistic thing. So, how can I know that I'm saved? I got to admit, that's kind of an erroneous question in the first place, because it's a matter of faith. How can I know? Hebrews 11.1 1 says, faith, faith is the assurance of things unseen. Something in my spirits, my experiences, assures me that I'm saved. But can I actually know it? I can know it in here. Up here is a different story. But let's go back to the Bible, okay? Acts 16 says, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. Believe. The Greek word translated as believe in the English is pestio, 
which means to believe, to put one's faith or trust in. And the application is that actions will follow your belief. So in turn, belief encompasses more than just knowing about Jesus. We have to act on that knowledge, combining faith and trust and putting it into practice. Salvation also entails repentance, turning around from what is broken, a sincere willingness to radically change our lives. Notice I said willingness, not necessarily ability. And we're here in the Pentecost season, so you know I've got to make a plug for the Holy Spirit. How do we do better when we know better, but we know we're falling short? We've got a holy energizer battery that gives us more ability than we possess on our own. So how can I know that I'm saved? Really, it's so simple that it's difficult. Romans 10 says, if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Period. How big is your tithe? Do you get past the velvet rope in heaven just because you give a little bit more? Does that secure your salvation? Were you born in a certain period of time, in a certain geographical area? Does that secure your salvation? If I'm nice to animals, does that secure my salvation? How can I know that I'm saved? Confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead and you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified. And it is with your mouth that you confess and are saved. So we get a two-part message there. How do I know I'm saved? I said it and I believe it. Does that mean I'm a walking saint? But I'm saved. But you remember what I was saying about salvation is, is not just a one-time thing? The Romans 10 passage tells us the same thing. If you're saved, you got to tell other people about it. With words, yes, but more importantly, with what? Actions. Hallelujah. When we ask the question, how can I be sure that I'm saved? Where does that question come from in the first place? In the affirmative, I want to be right with God and my neighbor. I really do. In the negative, I am terrified of damnation. Here's the thing. That second response is not from God. Those of you who've had to suffer under my preaching for 10 years or uh, subject yourselves to Bible study are going to be familiar with this phrase. Conviction comes from the Holy Spirit. Condemnation comes from Satan. How do we know that? Revelation 12, verses 10 through 12 says this. Then I heard a loud voice in heaven proclaiming, now have come the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Messiah. Because the accuser of our brothers and sisters has been thrown down. The one who accuses them day and night before God. But they will conquer him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. Because they didn't cling to life even in the face of death. Rejoice then, you heavens, and everyone who will dwell in them. But woe to the earth and sea, for the devil has been thrown down with great wrath. If you hear a voice in your head that says, 
hey, baby, you can do better. That might be the Lord. If you hear a voice that says, you're worthless, you're useless, give it up. Where do you think that voice came from? How can I be sure of my salvation? Because the word over and over and over and over and over and over and over again tells us believe, speak, and then put it into practice. Have we arrived yet? We're works in progress. And if we know we're screwing up, then we better step up. But if you confess Jesus Christ as Lord with your mouth and believe in your heart, then you are saved. If you're even asking the question, how can I be sure of my salvation? You're on the right path. Once again, one of the most often repeated sentiments throughout the entire Judeo-Christian Bible, the Hebrew Scriptures and the New Testament, is God's word, yes, of challenge when we're messing it up, but more importantly, God's word of peace and assurance when we're trying. Just one example, and again, guys, this sermon could have been weeks long, but one example from the prophet Isaiah, chapter 43, verses 1 and 2, says, Do not fear, for I have redeemed you, liberated you, set you free. I have summoned you by name. You are mine. When you pass through troubled waters, I will be with you. When you go through the tumultuous rivers, they will not sweep over you entirely. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. The flames will not set you ablaze. Peace be with you. Fear not. What then must I do to be saved? Confess with my mouth and believe in my heart. And then belief leads to action and the continual process, not only of my own salvation, but you remember we're agents of the living God, the Savior, the Messiah. If you're working out your own salvation with fear and trembling, that's going to rub off on the rest of the world. We're not here just to get, uh, get out of free Get, get out of jail free card for ourselves. We are here to build the kingdom, to establish salvation for all of God's children. And if we're doing that, then maybe we can't know, but we can know that we are being saved. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Pretty familiar hymn, isn't it? Why is it central to the musical canon of the Christian faith? Catholic, Protestant, non-denominational, evangelical. Blessed it means it's a gift. Assurance. It's OK, baby. I got you wrapped up in my love. Just admit you need me. Let's go ahead and close our message time for today with a moment of prayer. Creator, Redeemer, and Sustainer God, for as many people as are gathered together in this room, and as many friends are joining us online, are as many different unique experiences and reasons for gathering together in your name. Some of us accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior decades and decades ago. 
Some of us have been churchgoers our entire lives, but never really gave ourselves over to you. Some folks are just spiritually curious. And for them in particular, Lord, we give you thanks. And we pray your Pentecostal spirit will continue to guide them into the way, the truth, the life, salvation, liberation, redemption. Perhaps this morning we need that word of both challenge and comfort. That word from your word, which assures us of salvation, but also asks us to continue to live into it and pass it on. Some of us are scared about tomorrow. We pray for that ongoing peace that surpasses all human understanding that you promise in Philippians. Some of us know that you're out there, but we don't quite understand you. This Jesus guy seems pretty hip, had a lot of wonderful things to say, but what does this salvation thing mean? Honor their efforts and guide them closer to you. And finally, gracious and merciful God, on behalf of each and every one of us, we lift up before you our shortcomings, the things that we do that we really didn't want to do, our silly human foibles and misunderstandings, our fallen, greedy madness and malice, we admit our sins and we beg you for forgiveness. Save our souls, we pray humbly. Save our whole lives, we ask earnestly. Save the world. We pray with the heart of Jesus, not just for tomorrow, but for eternity as well. To you be the glory in this and in all things. And in the name of Jesus, our Savior, amen. Let's respond to the word of God through the gift of song with our hymn of response.
Amen. Please be seated. One of the ways that we walk closer with Jesus is by walking closer with one another. And we do that by lifting up each other's joys and concerns. So I draw your attention to the back of the weekly messenger insert. And there you will see our updated and ongoing prayer list as of printing time on Friday. Uh, for those who are joining us online, if you have a public prayer request, you can type it into the comments field of this video. If you have a confidential one, you can call, text, or email, instant message me directly, and we do abide by your privacy. Uh, beyond those items that you can read for yourself in black and white, I did want to share with you that uh, Kate Lionheart's grandfather was hospitalized uh, recently, but it was just yesterday, is that right, Kate? He, he's, he's gone to a rehab facility. So progress, if not perfection. And we praise God for the peace uh, that that does give you. Are there other joys and concerns uh, that anybody wants to lift up? Gladys? <laughs> Fair enough. Uh, we praise God for all of our young people um, and anybody who's, who's moving on from one chapter of their educational journey to the next. Uh, and, and we celebrate this season. Many of you um, are busier than uh, all get out going to graduation parties right now. Stark State, yeah, he was dual enrolled. Yep, he, he started college while he was still in high school. Hallelujah, gifted young man. Uh, Pat. Growing up, they're becoming more responsible and praise God. I'm sure. I'm sure. Praise the Lord for Caitlin, Zoe, Cami, uh, and, and, and travel mercies. Um, it, it, it's hard to let go. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And yeah, go ahead. Oh. Thank you, Pam. Um, <clears throat> their grandson, Grant, uh, repeated strep infections, uh, but he is scheduled to have his tonsils and his adenoids removed. Um, and, and we thank God for, for speedy uh, medical diagnosis and, and, and treatment. And we ask the great physician to be attending to him uh, during that procedure. Hi. Yeah, Jeff. Uh, Maestro Zimmerman of the Canton Symphony Orchestra passed away this weekend. Oh. And uh, we were blessed to have that wonderful, talented musician in our midst. He was, he was a wonderful man of music and a wonderful man. And blessings and prayers to him and his, him and his family. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, Maestro Zimmerman's uh, recent death. Um, thanks for his life and, his, and his, his testimony, not just his musical gifts, but the way he lived his life. Uh, and we stand with his friends and loved ones and colleagues and the whole community uh, in this moment of grief. Anybody else? Um, I do want to acknowledge in just a very generalized way that um, uh, this time of year, um, lots of folks are struggling with their allergies. And this year, the pollen count is obscenely high. And then the wildfires have made the air pollutants even worse. So I want to lift up anybody who's having respiratory or sinus distress at this moment for whatever reason, okay? 
Pray for rain. Yeah, there you go. Amen. Amen. All right, folks. God is with us. And God is for us. If we can be for God, for ourselves, and for one another. And just in the act of sharing our joys and concerns, that's testimony and assurance of his saving power at work in our midst. Yes, Gladys. Amen. Michael Weinstock, Kent State, uh, and mathematics. Praise the Lord. You are, you are a proud grandma. <laughs> All right, guys, let's go ahead and formalize our prayers at this time. God of Isaac and Jacob, God of Sarai and Abram, God of Ruth and Deborah, God of our brother and savior, Jesus the Christ, and his disciples throughout the ages. We thank you that we are saved through faith. Because you know we can't save ourselves. Sometimes we're fortunate enough to be part of saving someone else. But we all need you. And just that knowledge alone and leaning into it helps us to pursue your path of salvation. The Romans road, however, we want to refer to it. So today, oh God, we ask for that fuller understanding of salvation and a fuller experience of it. Let us rejoice in those things that are worthy of praise, milestones and graduations and new births. Let us trust in you in our times of distress and discomfort. Let us speak words of comfort to those who are grieving and aching right now. We know that whenever two or more gather in your name, you are present in their midst. We know that you hear the desires of our hearts before we can even utter a word. So now, Lord, even when we don't know what or how to pray, we're going to trust the promise of Scripture that your Holy Spirit will indeed intercede on our behalf with sighs and groanings too deep for human words as we lift up before you our individual, our personal, our private prayers and petitions. In the ups and the downs, in the divisions, the defeats, and the victories, we beg you to blanket us with your love and your saving power once more, O oh God. Assure us in lived experience that Jesus paid the price and we are secure and then strengthen us to pass that word on to a world deeply in need of you. As we ask you all of these things, we also want to renew our commitment to the will and way of our Savior, praying together the prayer he taught his own disciples, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen and amen.
as God's Spirit is poured out on us continually, as we are ongoingly being saved, we want to respond. And one of the ways that we respond is by investing in the work of the kingdom of Christ and his compassionate salvation. We contribute our time, talents, and treasures. As you know, we no longer pass the plates. They're at the back of the sanctuary as God gives you ability. But let us meditate on how we can contribute our tithes and offerings as we once more enjoy the gift of music. Amen. If you can keep standing as you're able and draw your attention to the prayer of dedication. Rejoicing in you, Lord, we lift up our offerings to praise your righteousness. With everything available to us, we want to honor you through our time, talents, and treasures. With lyres and harps, we want to sing a new song to you. For your word is upright, and all of your works are done in faithfulness. May our living and giving then serve your love and righteousness and justice. Let them and us declare that the earth is full of your steadfast love. By the word of your mouth, the heavens were made and every living thing within them are sustained by your breath. From the vast waters of the sea to everyone who lives, may the whole of creation stand in awe of you and allow everything we contribute to draw all the nations under your counsel. Your ways stand firm forever. Happy are those who have you as their God. Blessed are we who have chosen you. Amen. Thank you, Scott. Friends, as we get ready to take our salvation and put it into practice and to share it with others, uh, I do want to lift up the fact that uh, despite no one signing up ahead of time, 
uh, we had an embarrassment of riches for fellowship hour today. Uh, Karen Gerber stopped by and dropped off a whole spread of desserts, and then the Millers brought donuts too. So stick around and eat up, okay? Because the army of God marches on its belly, right? <laughs> Now may the Lord bless you and keep you and make the divine face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you, granting you everlasting peace and blessed assurance. Go in that peace, loving and serving the Lord and one another. Amen. Amen.